Hi, Don. It's a pleasure to have you present with us today. Thank you so much. It is indeed a beautiful day. Hi, Mala. Welcome, everybody. Dawn, uh, let, let me introduce Dawn, even though he doesn't need an introduction. Uh, Dawn is a managing director and a distinguished engineer at BNY Mellon. He's a Java champion, very popular speaker, creator of the Eclipse Collections Java Library, the topic of his talk today. And he has over two decades of experience and has been programming with Java since 1997. Wow. But he started programming when he was just 11 years old. OMG, I started programming when I was the same age. Of course, Java was not around then. And Dawn um, also likes karaoke. So Dawn, have you taken it to multiple cities, countries, or should I uh, say continents or planets with you? <laughs> I've been to multiple <laughs> countries and continents with my karaoke machine, but not to planets yet. So one day. <laughs> Great. I will not take much time and I'll let you start your presentation. So now let me add your screen to the stream and then I'll drop off. Um, I still need to see your screen. Probably you need to make it. Okay. Yes, I can see that up, now. Man? Okay. Oh, no. Um, okay. <laughs> Yes, it's okay now. So all the best and have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Mal. And it's again, welcome everybody to IntelliJ IdeaCon. So excited to be giving the keynote today. So as Mala said, I'll be talking about surviving open source and uh, you know, basically sharing uh, my experience over the last 18 years working on a project. Um, so quickly go through you know, some introductions. As Mala said, you know, some of the background information about me. For those, if you want to follow me on uh, um, Twitter, um, it's at the Don Rob or uh, Medium, um, donrob.medium.com. I do blog prolifically, um, so um, so some stuff about me. My slides will be available um, online as well. So let's get started. So when we think and talk about open source, um, it's important to understand that there are a lot of different paths available um, to get started on your journey. Uh, the first path that most of us uh, take actually is as a consumer of open source, right? And consumer might be something where you're maybe using an open source tool or um, more actively, let's say, incorporating an open source library into your project to you know, provide some feature that you need. Um, from being a consumer, you might move to being an advocate where maybe you recommend some open source tool that you're using to you know, one of your colleagues or you know, talk about it you know, in a blog or Tweet or something, and at that point, you're you know then providing some advocacy. Um, the next stage you might go to is you know becoming a contributor, and as a contributor, uh, maybe you're you know contributing code. It could be contributing documentation. It could be just contributing an issue to say like, hey, I found this bug. Um, do you want to address it? Um, from contributor, um, you, at some stage, if you've made lots of contributions on a project, you may actually, you know, earn the right to become a committer on that project. And a committer, you know, as I like to say, owns the keys to the kingdom. Someone who can actually merge commits into a repo um, and something like GitHub. So, um, you know, committers, once again, something that's typically earned. Um, I'm, I use terms, you know, from the Eclipse Foundation. Um, you know, and committer is one of the terms where you have to earn that through a meritocracy um, of showing contributions. Um, another type of path is a project lead. Now, project lead is really, um, you know, above and beyond what a committer is doing, is really planning what a release of a project will be and actually handling a lot of the uh, background tasks of making sure, um, you know, all the uh, licenses of, you know, um, dependencies are correct, working with, uh, you know, if you're working at a foundation, making sure everything um, goes through proper reviews and stuff. So, um, so it's a bit more involved than just being a committer, which is really focused on the code. Um, there's a path of being a sponsor. And when I think about being a sponsor, you know, this comes in different forms. Um, it might be actually sponsoring um, a project or sponsoring a foundation. Um, and sponsoring a project could be like, let's say, you know, maybe, you know, donating money to a project that um, is important to your organization. It could also be, you know, a sponsorship in terms of, you know, if you are working inside, let's say, financial services firm like I do, 
Uh, maybe you actually sponsor a project to actually make it out into open source. So actually, you know, um, helping to get a project actually moved out. A facilitator um, is, I guess, a role where and a path where, and I often think of things like open source program offices, which um, have become quite popular in the last, I would say, like five to 10 years, um, where an OSPO is really, you know, um, responsible to help projects and people um, actually come together and, you know, communities, you know, make it so that folks actually can work together. Um, finally, and this is what, um, you know, I'm going to be focusing on in today's talk, there's this path of creator where, you know, you've, let's say, come up with an idea, you know, implemented something and, you know, decide at some stage that you want to take this idea and move it out into open source. And this is what I refer to as the long road. Um, and there's, you know, so great examples of the long road out in the Java ecosystem. And I have a bunch of them listed here. And I'm sure, you know, if you're working in Java, you've either used some of these tools and, and libraries or incorporated. And they've been around for, you know, quite a long time, especially things like, you know, the OpenJDK, you know, JUnit, um, and things of this nature. So, and these things continue to, you know, go down this uh, long road that they started, you know, maybe as much as two decades ago. All right. So let's talk about the long road and the, the path that I went down um, and have been on since uh, 2004. So as Mala said, you know, I created the Eclipse Collections Library and it started out as an internal project in Goldman Sachs in 2004. And for eight years, it was an internal library going through, you know, um, you know, internal development cycles, um, gained, you know, popularity in the firm. And at some stage, we decided that it would, you know, be useful to actually open source the library. So this happened in 2012 and became a uh, tool product called GS Collections. And GS Collections sat out in GitHub. Um, for four years, we were working on it, and you can see the, you know, this is the contribution graph from 2012 to 2016. And you can see, you know, a moderate amount of activity uh, that was happening. I'm going to go into some more details about this particular project in a bit. Um, but then in 2015, Eclipse, or GS Collections was moved to the Eclipse Foundation and became Eclipse Collections. So from, you can see this contribution graph for Eclipse Collections from 2015 um, to where we are today in uh, 2022. And you can see, you know, a bit more activity than even, you know, GS Collections was seeing, and I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, I have this picture on the right kind of showing the way I think about um, these projects, right? And they're kind of like three distinct, I mean, they, they all share the, the same code and, and stuff, right? Maybe different package names, but um, I think about it in terms of an ice cream cone. Um, where when you have an ice cream cone, you can see the things at the top. Um, you can't really see the ice cream that's contained, you know, inside of the cone. Um, so you can see that's really caramel, GS Collections when it was open source, and then Eclipse Collections. So planning for survival. Okay, so one of the things I'll tell you is, um, you know, slight differences I see it between success and survival. So for success, and I, I've said this for, you know, probably many decades at this stage, some of the keys to my success are passion, patience, and persistence. And these are things that have served me very well um, in terms of, uh, you know, achieving different, um, you know, bits of success over my career. Survival, and I've had to put a little bit of thought to this, is much different, right? Because survival, um, you know, is really journey oriented. You know, you don't know what's going to be at the end per se, but you're going, you know, you're going to continue every day doing something. And some of the keys to survival I've noted are, are people. Um, you don't go it alone, right? So, um, you know, there's like different terms out there. Many hands make light work. Um, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, so it's also important to, you know, have a purpose, right? What is it that's driving you to keep on this journey that you're on? Um, it's important to see progress. Like, how do you know at some stage how you're doing? Um, what's going to keep you motivated to get the next step? And then perseverance, which is somewhat similar to persistence, but a little bit more, you know, 
in tune with like what it's like to be on a journey and kind of overcoming continual obstacles that you run into, right? Or uh, challenges. So in terms of planning for this, you know, journey that you might go on, um, it's important to think in decades. You want to occasionally reflect on your goals. Uh, it's very important to grow the community, right? And this is that people aspect. And part of, you know, really important thing, I think, a lot of projects I've seen don't do this, but it's very important is to celebrate wins on a regular basis. Um, this is something I guess, very you know important to me, prioritizing self-care. And I'm gonna talk a bit about, you know, um, how that's been a thing I've changed in my life um, very recently. Um, also important to look for forks in the road, right? Sometimes when you're on that beaten path going down the road, you know, on the stuff you're trying to accomplish, it's important to kind of like, go off on the side road occasionally, right? And it's something where, you know, taking, detracting maybe from your your focus on one, you know, particular journey, taking a slight offshoot, you actually can discover things and it's um, very helpful. I'm gonna talk about a particular fork in the road in here, which was, you know, contribution that I got to see make it into the OpenJDK. And then, you know, at the end, I'm gonna talk about, you know, letting um, your um, piece of work grow out in the wild. So let's you know, talk about thinking in decades, right? So um, we're, I'm almost to the end of the second decade of Eclipse Collections. It's been 18 years, right? So sitting down, you know, thinking about what it is we've done decade by decade. In the first decade, it was really you know, dominated by um, internal development in a financial services firm. Um, when it was open sourced, um, Caramel became GS Collections. The framework was free as in beer. Um, and what I mean by that is basically you could take the code. It was up in GitHub. It was also published to Maven Central, but no one but um, Goldman Sachs employees could actually contribute to the code base. At the time, we had uh, about four committers, and I think uh, look, looking at the GitHub, it was around 15 contributors to the code base. Um, there were more that you couldn't see, um, you know, previously when it was Caramel internally, but these were, you know, kind of the stats outside. Towards you know um, the last metric I had looked at for GS collections, it was getting around twenty thousand downloads per month. Um, I think in probably like two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen. So it was actually getting some decent uptake from Maven Central. Um, looking at the second day decade, um, and this is when we moved um, GS collections to the Eclipse Foundation. One of our primary focuses was to make. Um, Eclipse Collections, free as in speech. We wanted to invite contributors in and actually grow the community and not just have it be, you know, a tool dominated by a, a single firm. Um, what you'll see is like some of the progress we've had here, like we're now up to six committers and I have um, this tweet over on the right from the Eclipse Collections Twitter account that welcomed Sarisha Pratha, who was our most recent committer um, elected um, into the committer group. And so having six committers allows us to you know, take on you know, more work. And you can see we've actually also increased the number of contributors too. We're almost up to 100. And the downloads per month have you know, increased quite significantly as well. It's uh, almost, uh, I think it's between 220 and 240 now, um, 1,000 downloads per month from Maven Central. So as I'm coming to the end of my second decade of this, I'm thinking about what's the third decade going to look like for me and for this project. And what I'm really you know, looking to do is make sure that um, Eclipse Collections is community driven at the Eclipse Foundation. And I really want it to be free as in me, as you know, give me some th other things to maybe go focus on. And I've talked about, um, and this is a link when the slides are up there to a blog where I've, you know, a couple of years ago, I wrote down, this is what I think the next five years could look like for Eclipse Collections. And you know, these are potential ideas for things that people could do if they want to take it up. Um, at the end, what I really want is to make sure that we get, you know, more consumers, contributors, and committers really to help the, um, the project grow. So in terms of reflecting on goals, um, I'm going to have two sets of goals here. One are my past goals, and this is a snapshot of goals that I had back in 2017. Now, what you see is like um, some progress that's happened along here. One of my primary goals, you know, of doing all of this work was to help improve Java. Um, and this is something, you know, continues to be ongoing. Um, I was a former small talk developer in the 90s. Um, so, and that was, you know, I think one of the things that really led to me wanting to uh, develop 
from Eclipse Collections, you know, in the early days was I wanted the same product level, productivity level I had in small tech, at least for collections. And that's kind of like um, at this stage, pretty complete. Um, I've kind of gotten what I wanted out of that. Um, helping get Lambdas into Java, I was a member of the JSR 335 expert group that worked on, you know, the specification that got Lambdas into Java. So I can say like, that's done. Java 8 was delivered. Lambdas are here. Yay. Um, so, and that really, you know, gets to, you know, helping out some of that productivity that once again, I had in Smalltalk. I had, you know, blocks and Lambdas in Smalltalk for a long time. Now we have them in Java and things get easier. Uh, building a community users, um, that's ongoing. We've done the freeze in speech. Eclipse Collections exist. Anybody contribute. I'm still working on teaching several million Java developers. <laughs> so um, we have uh, katas and talks out there um, that folks can uh, take. Um, and I continue doing those things. So um, a couple of years ago, I had actually thrown together a proposal for a JSR for Collections 2.0. I've abandoned this idea. Um, this is something that requires funding and support. Maybe it comes back later, but it's not something I can just take on on my own and make happen. So um, I'd still think it would be a useful thing, but it, once again, um, it's not something that an individual can do on their own. In terms of goals today, um, things have uh, really, I, I would say, gotten a bit more focused and, you know, um, things that I care about now. It's like I still care about improving the Java programming language. and. There are several projects that um, I'm involved on and uh, you know work with in open source that are part of the Open JDK Quality Outreach Program. And I think this is an extremely important program where open source projects are giving feedback um, to the Open JDK, testing with early access editions of the JDK. So um, you know, providing this feedback is extremely important. And occasionally you'll help, you know, either find a bug or discover something and just increases the overall um, testing um, space that, you know, um, verifies that this, you know, tool that, you know, and language that we love um, continues to be, um, have great support and backwards compatibility and all these things. So um, in terms of growing the open source community, I still blog, I do code reviews um, in a GitHub for, you know, uh, pull requests. Um, I still occasionally write katas. Um, <laughs> lately, I've been doing a lot of jet lag driven development with my good friend, Jose Pomard. Um, so I'm looking to do some of that at Java One soon. Um, also doing talks and tweets um, are a good way to grow the community. Um, I've written down other things that I want to do in a blog, um, and I stopped doing, um, I don't know, uh, year-end resolutions each year and decided like I'd plan in decades. So two years ago, I wrote, or two or three years ago, I wrote down what my plans were for the next decade. And in the next decade, you know, you can go to the blog. It's really like focusing on, once again, different things. I want to, you know, maybe explore different open source projects to contribute to, maybe create other ones, right? Um, so all, uh, you know, out there and these things change, right? So important thing is to occasionally reflect on them. What's kind of driving you? In terms of growing the community, um, so it's very important to engage new open source contributors. And I do enjoy doing this a lot. So um, I try and create good first issues in GitHub. And, you know, it's very important to be inviting patient and kind. Understand that, you know, the first time someone contributes to open source, it's going to be a bit terrifying for them. Um, and having someone that's welcoming um, and helpful and once again, patient with uh, giving feedback and pointers is extremely useful. And um, very important to network with the community, being social, uh, be present and be authentic. And there's this great tweet um, from Gunter over on the, the right, which um, came out and I wasn't expecting this, but Gunter, you know, as his first contribution to open source had contributed to Eclipse Collections and wrote this amazing blog about his experience contributing to open source and then tweeted about it. Um, so, and this was a great thing like, you know, I hadn't met Gunter before, but I, I guess I probably did his uh, code review um, for his pull request. And it was great um, having this blog. And this is something now that I refer to other first time contributors like, hey, look at Gunter's blog and see the steps he went through to actually make his first contribution in the, the learning. So um, important to think about, I guess, the legacy of your project. I find it very helpful to uh, build katas for folks to help them build confidence about what the product does, right? Helps me build confidence as well. Like I can remember all the stuff that was added. 
very important to mentor and elect new committers and spending time with people to um, you know make sure they're getting the knowledge and skills that they need to actually become a committer and actually you, so that you can trust them to you know uh, be a part of the project and take it forward. Very important to provide support for your core team of committers. We're all human. We all have needs and time. And sometimes like one of those needs is like, you need to take a break, right? So um, providing support and making sure that there's a nice balance. And this is where like having more contributors, is, I'm sorry, committers is very helpful, right? So that you can actually have a balance when people, you know, want to come in or come out of working on the stuff, um, they're able to do that. And then it's going to turn celebrations into collaborations, right? So when Gunter, you know, tweeted this out, you know, I was on there retweeting, commenting and saying, this is great, thank you, right? Um, and celebrating um, the work that he did beyond his also contribution to the framework. So, which brings us to the importance of celebrating wins. So there are wins literally everywhere. And it, you know, no win is, you know, too small, <laughs> certainly not too big. Um, but to think about the types of wins that you have out there, you know, celebrating code contributions, Maybe it's library usage, right? Someone's um, using your library. Um, content contributions, maybe once again, someone updated your documentation or you know, um, you know, updated your website. And the website language translations, that's this is actually one of my personal favorites. You know, I'm lucky if I, I can barely speak English some days, um, and that's my first language. So um, having a translation to 11 different languages, this was something I didn't expect. And it was a wonderful um, addition to the library, having like 11 different languages for our website. And these were great contributions from the community. And every time a new language goes up, happy to like go celebrate it either via tweet or it'll be in the release blog. Here's the new language available, right? Um, celebrating advocacy, big milestones that happen. Maybe you like get a thousand you know, um, commits or you have a thousand stars on GitHub, whatever it is, right? Um, you know, maybe celebrating code use, thanking someone for, you know, reviewing your code. Um, definitely celebrating releases, extremely important, right? Telling people that this new thing is out there, tweeting about it, blogging about whatever. Um, celebrating and, you know, appreciating facilitation and sponsorship as well. I know like as a facilitator and sponsor myself for other open source projects. It's nice to hear once in a while that, hey, thank you for doing this. This is great. Um, it's nice to hear the feedback that people are feeling positive of the work that's going um, on. Now, this tweet over on the right was, um, you know, <laughs> example of a you know developer out in Germany who actually made an amazing contribution to um, Eclipse Collections, which wasn't in the code base itself. What he did was he actually had um, taken the time to write a Jackson serialization library that's now part of the Jackson project, but specifically for, you know, um, Eclipse collections. And this was like, this was a project that, you know, if I had the time, I wanted to sit down and do myself, but like, it was a lot of work, right? And when, you know, it got done and, you know, um, I found out about it and got in contact with uh, um, the developer, who's, uh, you can see his Twitter handle there. Um, definitely follow him on on Twitter, um, you know, I worked out basically like, hey, let's figure out how we can get uh, some mugs and stickers sent out. Cause this was like such an amazing contribution. Just really wanted to share some appreciation. So like gave some mugs and stickers to a fellow Java champion um, who lived in Germany at, you know, Java one. And he took them out and actually, you know, shipped them locally for us to uh, the developer. So, and this was, uh, you know, the response tweet from, um, the developer saying like, hey, you received the mugs and you know stickers. And this is great. And just like, once again, celebrating this win. This is amazing. So definitely show appreciation. Now, um, prioritizing self-care. And I'm going to, you know, just have to tell you all that um, over the last 30 years that I've worked in my career, I have created, I have treated my body like a temple of doom. Um, and what I mean is like, I really was not prioritizing self-care for a lot of the, you know, last 30 years that I've been, um, you know, uh, working and it's really in the last two to three years. Right. And I think a lot of it driven, you know, maybe by the pandemic. And I think one of the just side effect benefits is I took up riding on my bike and I hadn't ridden my bike regularly for a very long time. And doing that was extremely important. You can see a picture. This is a picture of my bike down at the uh, Jersey Shore, um, where I go every summer. And just 
you know, so important to uh, make sure that you do prioritize self-care. So this is something I can tell you from experience. I wish I had taken up earlier and done more of because now I feel amazing, so much, you know, better and like um, taking bike rides just become like great, you know, personal therapy for me. Um, but another thing, um, you know, things I would, you know, say are very important, and it was another side effect of, I would say, like having to work remotely, having an optimal work environment for you. So you can see me here, um, you know, on screen, I'm actually at a standing desk. And this is an investment I made um, into my home office environment. And it's, you know, in addition to biking, like, you know, making sure I'm not just in my seat all day for, you know, 10 hours you know, working, coding away, like um, getting up, standing up, um, very important. So and I find, you know, it's um, has helped, you know, just um, increase the overall comfort, happiness, productivity. Also very important to take breaks, right? And this could be the short breaks on a daily basis, but also just take breaks from, you know, the focus on the project that you're working on. Um, you just can't keep at it for 18 years straight without actually having some occasional like, hey, you know what? I'm going to not be doing anything this month or maybe for the next two months, you know, other folks, you can, you know, pick up the slack, right? So important to do that. Very important to make sure like, you know, um, spending time with family and friends. Um, you know, I do make, have always made it a priority to have um, a few weeks of focused vacation time um, where I can really focus on stuff. But like, just doing the odd out weekends, whatever, um, been doing that a lot more and find it's been extremely helpful. I already talked about the exercising regularly. I do like, um, when I bike now, it's anywhere between, let's say five to 15 miles, um, I'll ride. And, you know, the longer I can go, the better I feel. <laughs> um, so definitely do things that bring you joy. And there's a link here when the slides go out to, um, a blog I wrote about called the joy of programming. And I talk about the last 40 years that I've been coding. Um, so, and things that bring me joy um, in that space. So, and it's important to find those things that you enjoy and do them, right? Because that's where like you find your passion and your creativity. Um, celebrate your personal wins, right? Occasionally like I go out and, you know, I ride my bike and I'll post pictures of my sunset, but I'll, you know, maybe post a picture of like how many miles I was able to ride today. It's like, that's a personal win. Um, and then very important to encourage the same self-care uh, for the committers and contributors that work on your project, right? If you see them going too hard, doing too much, like, you know, um, make sure they uh, um, spend some time once again on them on themselves and taking care of things. So, um, and that's, I guess, a good segue then to um, the next uh, topic here, which is looking for forks in the road. And one of the forks, um, that um, I encountered in my on my journey of working um, in open source on Eclipse collections um, was um, a what became a potential opportunity to contribute something to the Open JDK. Um, so back in um, 2013, I was in London and I was doing some testing of the early version of uh, Java 8 before it was released, you know, the I was working with some binaries doing testing of the, you know, things in streams. And actually I was doing testing of like parallel streams with Eclipse collections, or at the time it was GS collections. And I saw something weird. And so I went, started down this process and I didn't know that this is what was going to happen out of it, but I started on this process where like, you know, I saw something and then I said something and then I had to spend time proving something. And then at the end, I didn't wind up doing the implementation myself. It was Hiroshi Ito and Paul Sandos, who's one of the, you know, works on the core JDK team at Oracle, who actually made the contribution. But it was something that, um, and I have links in the slides to basically conversations that happened initially in the Lambda Lib Spec Experts group, which I was a member of from JS JSR 335. And this is where like we would have, let's say, email, public email design discussions. And you can see like, you know, there's an archive out there if you want to see what happened in all those years before Lambda's made it into Java. But basically I proposed, you know, said, saw this thing um, where there was a performance issue um, that I was seeing when using parallel streams with um, uh, the, at the time, GS collections types. And I was pondering over it. It was like the performance was like pretty horrible. And what I discovered was there was 
a implementation, a default implementation provided to non-JDK um, collections. So when Java 8 was released, you got default implementations on, let's say, the collections interface for, um, for Stream and for Splitterator. And the default implementations for non-JDK collections was using this thing called an iterator splitterator, which actually wound up you know, being pretty horrible for um, if you had a random access list and um, for doing a um, you know implementation of parallel streams. So I had to sit down, write a whole bunch of benchmarks to kind of prove to myself, but ultimately to prove um, to uh, you know the core open JDK team that there was an issue here worth addressing. And it was for um, libraries like Eclipse Collections, right? So, you know, um, at the end, what finally, you know, happened after doing, you know, several years of, uh, you know, um, work and stuff, and there's actually, if actually go back, um, if you look, there's actually a link here to a blog. I, I chronicled this all in a blog about, you know, um, what happened in over the periods of time more detail. So you can dig into that if you want. But at the end, what finally came out of all this work was there's a new, um, uh, class and it's a uh, you know protected class that's actually in abstract list. It's called random access splitterator. It was added in Java nine, so in September of 2013. So from initial um, identification was May of 2013, <laughs> um, and then ultimately into uh, production in uh, September 2017. So you can see like you know over four years, but the code made it in there, right? And it took a long time, um, and there were like different reasons. And I would say like. The lesson I kind of learned is it's it's necessarily hard to get things into the you know the JDK because this is code that's been around for now 27 years and it's going to be around for another 50 to 100. Um, really projecting on that, but you know at least another 25. But you know code stays around for a long time and there's so much usage of the um, the language and libraries. It's very important to make sure that every little thing that gets in there is going to stand the test of time, right? Um, because there is a cost to having to maintain things for that long. So while it's hard, it is possible. We did see random access splitterator make it in. And I can, you know, it's funny because when it made it in Java 9, uh, because like a lot of, I would say, large companies use LTS versions of uh, Java, it's like I really haven't started using it until Java 11 was released, right? So, but it's nice to see like, hey, this thing exists out here. It actually helps for performance of parallel streams. With any libraries that have random access lists, um, um, you know, implementations on their own. So, um, so yeah, I would say once again, if you can follow that process of you see something, you say something, you prove something, um, and then you do something, and you're willing to put in the time, you're passionate about the stuff that um, you know you're trying to get in there, and I would say. Make sure you understand the folks on the Open JDK, the, the core team of uh, you know committers there. Um, they're very receptive and open to ideas, um, but you know they have and we all have limited amount of time. Just re be respectful. Like something you're putting forward, they may come back and just say no, right? And it's okay. I've had a lot of you know ideas I propose just not wind up in there, right? Um, but you know it's possible that one day you have some great idea and actually helps things out. So. Um, just want to say it is possible. Okay, um, my final um, bit of advice to the community. So, at some stage um, in the evolution of your project and really the evolution of yourself, um, you know, it might be time to let it grow. And part of it's like let it go. Like, don't be a hel helicopter parent for your work, right? Um, and things that you need to do on your to do list to do this, you know. Plan for your work to survive without you, but also like create this space for others to be able to lead and take over, right? And find their own, you know, either you know paths or long roads that they could work on, right? I've done quite a bit of trying to write down all the things I remember from the last two decades. So I have, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say a ton of blogs, but I was blogging at least once a month for the last five years on Medium, and I've tried to write down things I think were interesting. And I was really last year around this, uh, well, actually it was in August of last year, I wrote like five blogs, um, you know, blog series titled The Missing Java Data Structures No One Ever Told You About. And I tried to capture all those things that kind of like, they're not unique to um, Eclipse Collections in certain cases. Like there are other libraries and frameworks out there that have maybe similar things, but um, 
they were things that were not in the JDK itself, right? Um, and that could be like, let's say bags or multi-maps or mutable collections or primitive collections. Um, with a library like Eclipse Collections, it's very important. It's like, you know, um, it's over a million lines of code. That's daunting and seems scary. A lot of it's code generated because we have primitive collection support. But so visualizing on the library, it's like, you know, if a developer comes in and sees, hey, oh my gosh, there's a million lines of code. What do I do with all this? Like visualizations actually help to, once again, make it easier to understand where they can uh, find things and, you know, how things are organized. Um, having, you know, a list of succinct, why would you use this thing is very useful. So I've kept a blog up to date over the years called 10 Reasons to Use Eclipse Collections. Then finally, you know, um, it's not important to leave your project. You don't have to just abandon it, right? So I'm taking a break now um, and we'll be doing so for you know some time. And what it means for me taking the break and I've written down, you know, I have a blog titled Sending the Open Source Library I Created Off to College. So it's been 18 years for me, right? It's a long, long, long time. Um, and, uh, you know, after 18 years and some of like, you know, I have a daughter currently in college and a son you know, about to go into college and, you know, happens in the U.S. at 18. So uh, figured like, hey, sending this kid off to college and, uh, you know, let, you know, the project kind of go its own way and grow, you know, help it along when it needs it, right? So I, I do, once again, like helping new open source contributors go up that learning path. I get a lot of joy out of seeing people discovering the fun of, you know, contributing to open source and helping that happen, right? So I do still create good first issues and, and do code reviews, but I haven't I haven't coded on Eclipse Collections I think since June, um, and I'm not planning to anytime soon. I'll help others learn and stuff, and I'll probably still blog. I still blog about usage patterns I see, so that's fun. But um, letting others once again um, take it where they want it. I've written down some ideas how they could do that, um, and the stage I'm letting it go so it can grow. So, and. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for my content. So I think we can, uh, I'm going to hand it back to uh, um, Mala and we can take some questions. So. Hi, Don. First of all, thank you so much. That was an amazing session. Thank you so much. There was so much in uh, the session. I was kind of in awe uh, because I, I think there are so many challenges that people kind of fail to see You're talking about a project that you have been working for 18 long years. So if I uh, talk from the beginning, it's one has to be really brave to start such kind of a project. And uh, when you go along, there's so many challenges. I, I'm really fascinated by um, the goal slide that you had and reflecting on them because as you mentioned we were talking about it earlier there could be some goals and you might want to change them depending on how the project is going and um it, it was so much of them of course talking about joy because it's difficult to kind of keep working with a project which is not your work project without having the joy of course getting into uh, your code into java api Many congratulations. Thanks. And I know <laughs> the, the one of the most difficult part as a parent would be letting it go and grow. So, so much, so much of that. So, yeah, yes. and I guess so, I, one thing I would add, it's interesting because I didn't talk about this in the goals, but, um, you know, one of the things I would point out with um, in the way I think about open source, open sourcing really was never a goal. Um, for the project. Mm -hmm. um, it was more of a vehicle for the journey I was going on. Mm -hmm. And it was like to achieve those mm -hmm. other goals, right? So it's not like if I open source this thing, it's going to be success. No, uh -uh. It's just it, the journey is still continuing, right? And the journey changes from, let's say, being an internal development to open source. So I think I would, you know, clarify that in terms of that. If it shouldn't have been on my goal slide, it wasn't a goal. Um, there was the, once again, changing the paradigm of open source from, you know, free as in beer to free as in speech and allowing the community to really become a part of the work was an important goal. So. Yes. And, um, I, I really loved how you talked about, uh, supporting the team members that you have on your project and celebrating every big and small win, because that's really, really important. 
Yeah, I would actually give a quick shout out because I see uh, the comments are like flying by here. So I'm not going to be able to read them all. Mm -hmm. But like, I know Nikhil is actually mm -hmm. presenting today. So Nikhil is actually, you know, my mm -hmm. co-project lead and has been working with, you know, Eclipse mm -hmm. Collections, you know, it's probably going, you know, and before it in GS Collections, probably like almost a decade. Um, so, mm -hmm. and Nikhil is a project lead. He takes some of that brunt and, you know, helps share the burden of once again, carrying mm -hmm this thing forward on the journey. So it's so helpful having folks like Nikhil to work with in the community. It's amazing. So definitely, you know, I guess he's talking to uh, a set, two sessions after this one. So let's check right. out his session. That's right. And um, so I want to ask this question. When you uh, talk about your project with our folks or when they approach you, do they talk about, uh, because we have this trend of knowing the best thing and the worst thing about anything. So do you get questions like what have been the easiest part uh, in this journey or the most difficult part? Or are they even asking the right questions? <laughs> It is, it is a very interesting question. Um, I get asked a lot of different questions. In the early days, it was, how did you do this? Because like open sourcing of financial mm -hmm. services to a lot of other folks yes. who worked in financial services felt like it was like an impossible task. And we you know, did this in 2012 where open sourcing mm -hmm. stuff was less um, familiar. But I would say in terms of the question itself, like what was easy? Surprisingly, one of the easiest things for me was like, when you open source something from a large company was um, getting to actually build friendships and relationships in strange places like in legal and in compliance and um, in tech risk and building relationships outside mm -hmm. of technology. That was an unexpectedly easy thing where, um, you know, I was mm -hmm. expecting it to be terrible and difficult. Um, but uh, mm. yeah, in terms of hard, there's been, I guess, a lot of hard things. I don't know why I could pull one thing out. It's like, it depends on, you know, um, different things. I think um, making decisions about what to do might be the hardest thing, right? It's like, how are we going to, yeah. you know, what do we want to set our minds to? And then it's like, once again, that short term journey of how to get there can be hard sometimes. I, I completely agree. So there's another interesting question. How do you manage funding for the project? So that's what asked by one of the viewers. <laughs> well, I buy the stickers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It, it, mm -hmm. There is, um, you know, the funding is really comes mm -hmm. in the terms of time from people, right? So um, mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, I find, and the reason why that developed Eclipse Collections is because I wanted to use it. I was using it on the projects I was working on. So it is, you know, mm -hmm. some of the funding is like, we needed these things, but we have so much stuff in the framework. We built stuff mm -hmm. many years ago that maybe we had to fund to solve specific problems that we had at some stage. And like every once in a while, we see some new problem that has to be solved. And so again, the funding at this stage comes from people contributing their time when they need something, right? And we tend to only add mm -hmm. things to the library when it's needed, right? Not mm -hmm. on a, you know, convenience. So, um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say like people, once again, taking their time, it might be, uh, you know, that they need something on their job or they just want to contribute. So there is no, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, some GoFundMe or anything <laughs> <laughs> or GitHub sponsorship for Eclipse Collections. But, uh, you know, once again, stickers and t-shirts, mm -hmm. I occasionally, you know, um, as you know, mm -hmm. the, the creator, I feel like, hey, this is something worth investing in. Um, to mm -hmm. uh, you know, people do like you know having stickers, so I have a whole bunch. So I'll have a job one for folks. So that's that's great because funding, as you said, could come in multiple ways. It's not just about uh, the capital that we're talking about. Time and efforts and support by um, a lot of people is very important. Very important. Uh, so there's another question uh, regarding, because you mentioned that you've been using Eclipse collection at work. So have you come across any misuse of collections or probably we could think of this question of, um, as in you created something and you see other people's uh, not using it in, in the intended way. What do you do about that? Part? I blog. <laughs> I blog <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I see stuff and like, yeah, um, yeah. sometimes, you know, if I, if I know the developer, I'll actually spend the time mm -hmm. to say like, Hey, there's this better way of doing things. And that's one of the interesting problems is, you know, when you have a framework that it wasn't like planned from the beginning, 
this is all the things we're going to have and it's how it's going to work. It, it evolved over a long time. And I think one of the things that evolved, um, you know, in the early days, we started off with, let's say, um, utility classes. So people got used to using those. And then we created our own, let's say, mutable collections and people use those. And then um, when we created an immutable collection hierarchy, we had this problem of like the way you construct types instead of like mm -hmm. using, let's say, the type itself, we started introducing these factories. So I'd often see like patterns mm -hmm. where folks were using a clip or at the early days, Caramel or GS collections for so long, they had a lot of the early ways of doing things still in their code. I had to teach them about, there are these mm -hmm. newer ways that actually make your code better. So um, so anytime I see it, it's, it's an opportunity to, to spend some time, you know, with the developer and actually show them stuff, and uh, usually results in you know some great conversations and learning. So, learning for me as well, because okay. I can see like how people are actually using it, right? So, mm -mm. yes. When I asked you that question, I was I kind of thought of this answer that you would be talking about educating our people uh, to how to use it in the way it should be intent. It is intent to because this happens all the time with everything around us. Um, did, did you also notice anything regarding um, uh, the copyright issues or any uh, licensing issues like you saw the code being copied or because uh, are there any licensing issues that you um, came across with your... No, I mean, we, and, uh, it's interesting because like, and this is where once again, having, you know, building good relationships with uh, your legal department and you have to do, I guess, a lot of... <laughs> you know, understanding of, mm -hmm. about what licenses are, how copyright works, right? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, what's interesting, what we tried to do with Eclipse Collection, so initially GS Collections, when it was open source, was Apache 2.0, which I think is very cor corporate mm -hmm. friendly. friendly. Mm -hmm. um, when mm -hmm. we open sourced um, and moved to the Eclipse Foundation, we decided to dual license the project. So it's actually has two licenses, right? It has the Eclipse mm -hmm. public license, um, which, you know, as far as I understand, it feels a little bit more, you know, copy left, um, if you, you want to Google that mm -hmm. and figure that out. But like, it's also under the Eclipse distribution license is an option you can consume it under, which is really, I think it's a BSD style free, which is really more permissive about how you can use the code. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to have that because like, we didn't really want to restrict how you use these things. And if you look at the goals, right, I'm trying to improve the language and productivity of myself and other developers. I, I don't make money off mm -hmm. of this, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, in terms of copying the code, yeah, follow the licenses, understand those, but um, I haven't had, mm -hmm. you know, problems of, you know, someone has, uh, well, maybe there's a fork that exists out there. <laughs> if there is, good luck. <laughs> Do you want to maintain the multi lines of code? <laughs> uh, that's, that's an interesting way to kind of look at it. Um, I know you talked about, uh, your journey, but if I were to ask you what have been the highlights of your career when you talk about Eclipse collect collections? Um, I know definitely it's a, a highlight question. for me was actually <laughs> uh, becoming part of the JSR 335 expert group. And um, it was such a, such an honor and humbling experience because, uh, you know, this was, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'd never been on a JSR expert group before. Um, so it was a bit daunting, mm -hmm. you know, it's scary. And I'm there with folks like, you know, the Java language architect, Brian Getz, and, you know, had Josh Block and Doug Lee. And like, these are like the industry luminaries. And I'm just yes. some random dude from Goldman Sachs. Like, what do I know about anything? Right. <laughs> so in terms of open source being a vehicle, um, by open sourcing, you know, GS collections, at least I was able to show the stuff that we were looking at inside of Goldman that I was actually using on all the projects that I was working on to share like, this is what mm -hmm. we see as an opportunity for Lambdas really to help, you know, the productivity. Lambdas and collections enabled mm -hmm. Lambdas to help developers. And we had thousands upon thousands of use cases um, in the firm that would mm -hmm. benefit. So sharing that was huge. And But just being on that expert group and being able to see like, you know, be part of these discussions about this such an important you know, change the language. Like to me, that was like pivotal in terms of like a, a huge change in my career. Cause I went from being a proprietary financial services developer to now having something out in open source that's helping, let's say inform an expert group that I'm working on to like, 
now I have to mm -hmm. support and maintain this open source project. And where does that go? And what is, happens there, right? So, and I would say a second thing to me is like, um, you know, getting the honor of um, being, you know, um, you know, selected as a Java champion. Like I never expected that. Mm -hmm. That was, um, that was kind of neat. And that mm -hmm. just created whole other opportunities I hadn't expected. Like there's this great network of Java champions. Like I get to talk with Mala Gupta. And, uh, you know, yeah. and all these other folks so in the community. It's like, it's so amazing. Like, I, I don't know how I went 20 years of my career without talking to anybody other than the people I worked with mm -hmm. in the company. And now, like, I feel like I'm connected to this universe of, uh, you know, developers across the globe. And I can just immediately have a conversation with uh, someone, you know, via Twitter or something else. It's just incredible. So. That's, that's really interesting. So did you add to your bio, uh, creator of Eclipse Collection, which is used by billions of uh, devices and something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how it's used by billions of devices. Um, you know, I can hope one day. Um, and it's funny because I, I did tell him a talk um, I gave back in 2019 at the Open Source Strategy Forum. One of the greatest things you have as a developer is, is knowing that your code is used, right? It's actually helping yes. someone in production, right? So, you know, I, I do love hearing stories of like, hey, your project's helping this and finding out like, you know, Eclipse Collections becomes a dependency in some other project. And there are other open source projects that depend on it. Um, so, um, you know, it's great when you hear about these things. And once again, I'm a huge fan of making sure we celebrate them, right? So. Absolutely. So what advice would you have for people who would want to get started with the uh, a similar project or contributing to open source projects? Um, I would say, you know, uh, try and get in touch, like either through um, look at the good first issues, but like see the communities that are out there for individual projects, you know, get in touch with folks. And um, it's it's hard for me to tell like where to get started. I, mean, I covered like all the different paths you could go down. Definitely like try out, you know, project first, right? Before you want to jump in and like, I want to contribute code, maybe try it. Because <laughs> actually understanding what the, you know, the project does and how it works is really helpful to then understand how, how you could actually change it, right? So understanding what its purpose is, what it does, how it um, helps you is useful. And this is where like the katas I talked about briefly are extremely important. Yes. Like having a place where you can get started to learn something with hands-on coding, and then that could maybe inform you like, hey, I wonder if they have this, I wonder if they do this, and you can look at what's getting issues and you have a better idea and sense of where you could get started, so. So I'll, I'll take the last question. Um, what questions do you uh, get regarding the hurdles that people face while they try to contribute to open source projects and also some of the myths that you might have heard of? Oh, wow. Um, I have what two minutes? <laughs> um. <laughs> okay. Not even one minute. Um, yeah, I would say um, one of the hurdles, um, especially like a large code base like Eclipse Collections, you know, getting through the project mm -hmm. setup, um, we try and make it easy to you know download the code and build it. Um, but you know, it's it's a lot of code. You know, there's, there's a compilation process. We do do um, you know. Uh, lots of testing. So we have, it's interesting, we try and make sure the tests run extremely fast. Like we have, I think, 160,000 plus unit tests. And my goal for them is always to run as close to a minute or less as possible. I think on my machine, it takes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe a minute and a half. But um, um, I would say like, you know, just, you know, that initial hurdle of there's this huge pile of stuff. And this is where like things like visualizations and blogs kind of help to, you know, show how things are laid out um, and the stuff. Mm -hmm. So definitely, I guess that's one of the challenges and hurdles too, is just making sure like our documentation continues to improve. So that first step right. is not painful for someone, right? It's like, hey, I'm thrown into this like huge right. ocean of stuff. How do I, you know, yes. find land and get started, right? So. Mm -hmm. So, Sean, uh, I will not ask any more questions because I think we're running out of time. Thank you so much. It was lovely to hear from you and I could go on talking with you for another hour, but I know I have to stop. If there are any closing comments by you, do you want me to add your screen to the stream? 
Um, no, that's okay. I'll just, uh, you know, I'll just in closing say okay. thank you, Mala. Um, this was uh, mm -hmm. great. You know, being able to tell your story of 18 years is is quite, you know, an honor. Like, um, you know, I've done similar things over the years inside of banks that I work at, you know, telling my open source story. So doing this, you know, publicly, um, it's a bit different than what I'm used to. Usually I'm talking about Eclipse Collections. This, well, I mean, there was some Eclipse Collections in here, but I'm mostly showing code, right? <laughs> um, so um, I hope you know, other folks, um, you know, if you get started on your journey, um, I would wish you good luck. If you go down this, you know, long road path of creating something, um, keep at it. Um, you're going to, you know, have good days and bad days. And uh, if you're, if you believe in it and you're passionate about it, you know, um, just uh, persevere, um, you know, it's again, check in on yourself, make sure you're taking the self care, don't overdo it. Um, but, you know, enjoy the things and really look to the community um, that you can build around something. Right. I think I don't I wouldn't want to build something where I was the only one who cared about it. Right. So being able to actually find, you know, build a community where there's like minded folks to see the benefit really mm -hmm. beneficial. So but I'll stop yapping. We're, getting, we're over time. So <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much. Pleasure. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.